hey there, cats and kittens, guys and dolls. Welcome back to another edition of the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. Uh, I apologize. I thought I had written and reviewed a few more things, and I thought I had another show for last week, but I didn't. So I'm going to try and get this in this week and then record a few more way, way in advance um, and get that all out for you so that I can kind of relax and, and focus on writing nowadays that I'm free. Um, but anyway, this is the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I am Ray, and before I go any further, I do want to say a thank you to uh, my my dear editor and, and producer, uh, Ramon, who has been very kindly and uh, very funnily adding things to uh, the start of some of the podcasts that I didn't notice uh, until after the fact. For example, uh, the one night that my cat jumped on my shoulder during a, a, a review, uh, he made a Dr. Evil reference to me. Uh, and I thought that was really funny, and it was well appropriate because um, I just figured I'm going to just keep going through this and, and not stop. Even if my cat's butt is in the air and you're going to see her behind, it's okay. You, you've seen a cat's butt before, I'm sure, um, and you see them in the real life every day. But uh, he added that little mini-me kind of thing, you know, Dr. Evil in there, and I thought that was good. And he very generously added, without my requesting it at all, um, and I'm not complaining, uh, really not, um, where he had put on there, buy my book. Uh, where it, it was basically just saying, you know, here is the Nightmare Game. It's out. Uh, pick up NGS. And I was like, wow, that was really kind of him. And again, I didn't notice that until well after the fact. Um, so I do want to say thank you to Ramon for that. It is deeply appreciated. And, you know, we don't talk a whole lot. We just kind of say, here's the stuff, and we go. Uh, we have our own separate lives. And I, I do appreciate him. I do count him as a friend. I hope he feels the same way. Um, but we don't have a lot of contact because basically my life prior to now has been insanely busy and I haven't really had people that I chatted with on a constant basis in real life, in person, let alone over the internet. So, you know, now that I'm a little bit uh, less constrained in that manner, um, maybe things will change in some certain ways. But for now, um, it is just what it is. So I just want to say thank you. It is very appreciated, Ramon. It really is. Um, and the other thing is I want to say is that this is the Little RPG Audiobook Podcast. I will be reviewing some new and some possibly classic. But it's all new, babies. It's all new. Lit RPG audiobooks for you today. So uh, keep listening. Okay, I'm going to start off today with a book that I just found out actually has five books in the series so far. I just kind of got this book on a whim. Uh, hadn't heard anything about it. Hadn't had any words. Sometimes people say, hey, Ray, can you check this book out and tell me what you think? Um, or will you listen to my book and, and give me an idea, you know, what? give me your feedback and, and whatever. And I'm like happy to do whatever I can. Um, and sometimes I just go through and see what's out there. And um, Civ CEO was one of those ones that looked interesting to me. So let me give you the information first and then I'll get into it. Uh, Civ CEO, the Accidental Champion series book one, which has got no relation to the other Accidental Champion stuff by Jamie Davis, by Andrew Karavik with a narration by Neil Helligers. And the series has a, or the book has a length of seven hours and 15 minutes. Don't get me wrong. I believe in community. I believe in teamwork to an extent. At the end of the day, you'll be the one left alone, forced to handle whatever problem is in front of you. People will abandon you, especially when they realize they can't get what they want from you. This might sound jaded, but in my entire life, all I've ever seen is the absolute worst in people. If you don't keep an eye on them, they will hurt you. It's best to give them what they want and remove any of the troublemakers from your company as quickly as possible. Of course, you don't tell this to a large room full of eager, wide-eyed people looking to you for some kind of wise advice about life. You tell them what they want to hear. You give an uplifting story, tell a few maxims and a few quotes from people who inspired you. I've sat through enough PR prep meetings to know what not to say. I'd call it lying, but truthfully, no one wants real honesty. If they did, they'd know that there's nothing some rich guy could tell them that would turn their lives around. So, like I say, I kind of I kind of stumbled onto this book. Um, and I, I remember when it was first released as an ebook. I thought, man, it, it looks interesting. Um, I hope it makes it to Audible. I hope it gets that far. Uh, because not everything ever does, and I understand that nowadays, especially with the way things Amazon has changed things. Um, so the dynamics between authors and narrators have really taken a nosedive lately with 
you know, shared royalties and that sort of thing. So, you know, I was happy to see Civ CEO get the, the audible treatment to start with. And then Neil Helligers, who, you know, I love him from a couple other things. So I was happy to, to do this. And really, if you want to know the truth of it, it was Neil who sold me the book. So if you want to say, what was the deciding factor? It wasn't the cover. The cover's good. I like the cover. It's okay. Um, it wasn't the, the writer. I've never heard of Andrew Kavarik until I got this book. It was it was basically, it was Neil Helliger's. So, you know, Andrew, you have Neil to thank for the review if it's good. And if you don't, then that's on you. <laughs> if it's not. Um, but, uh, no, I mean, the book is really fun. CEO, Civ CEO is basically a civilization building um, book. Um, it starts off with a village, and I, I'm assuming that it's going to get bigger in scope as the book series goes along. I have not read or looked up anything at all from book two, book three, book four, book five. I just looked on Amazon and saw it had five books. So um, my going into this is completely cold. Uh, and like I say, it's a rare book insofar that it has compelling story with minimal battle included. And what the book is about is generally there's this 80-year-old man who accidentally gets snagged and taken to a fantasy world. Uh, he just happened to accidentally be standing beside the person who was meant to be the hero of a certain god. Uh, the old man had just retired from the head of a company after turning 80. Um, he was discarded, kind of just said, okay, look, you know, they, they said, look, man, you're, you're too old to do this anymore. We're worried about your health, which means stock prices, I'm sure. Um, and we need to get you out of here before something happens and everything crumbles. Um, so he finds himself discarded by his company, and then he is discarded by the god who brought him there because it's not the right person. And like, eh, just go wander around and you'll be fine, I'm sure. And he's like, well, I can't get home from here, you know, whatever. Nope, you're on your own, dude. And the god, like, flits out of there, right? So the one upside is he finds that he has a body that is now in the prime of his life because bringing them from our world to this world that he's in now, um, they want like somebody who is in tip-top condition. So they're void of any illnesses. They're void of any issues whatsoever. Like if you had arthritis, gone. You know, if you had pancreatitis, gone. If you had gallstones or you know, kidney stuff, gone. You're good. Okay, so now he's no longer 80. He's in like maybe his late 20s, very early 30s. Very physically fit, he's very happy, and he finds out later that he doesn't age anymore either. So he basically ends up going to the village that he was supposed to be the champion of if he had been the right person. And the god was like, Well, I'll be back in about 300 years with the, you know, whatever. So the village is like, Why don't you step in and, and do this? Because I can't do it. We're not doing it right. We're, we're still at like level one for the last, you know, 100 years or whatever. Get us built up. And he's like, okay. So he takes this job because, of course, he's missing his old work. Um, and it becomes his responsibility to grow and increase the village, make it make it prosperous and protect it from outside forces, just like you would. And it really reminded me a lot of the original World of Warcraft games where you would have, like, you know, so many of the, the people, whether it was orcs, elves, or humans, uh, and they'd be standing around going, you know, what do you want me to do? And you click the guy and he'd go, okay, you go, you go get wood, you go get mine, you you, you know, you go mine, you uh, you build this, you do this. So you have people going out and doing things and expanding territories, but you know, by by exploring and that sort of thing. Um, and until you met up with another group and then you had to fight them. Well, here it's not quite exactly like that, but it's pretty close. Um, it's pretty close. Um, you know, the fighting is not necessarily there, okay, but that said, the book is going to really sound kind of dull uh, when I tell you it's a lot of economic lessons and focuses mainly on the town building. Um, and that's it. That's it. In fact, there are really a few other things you normally get in a book. Like, you know, they're, they're not there. Like, where's the love interest or the main bad guy or the protagonist? There is no main villain in this book whatsoever. Um, so if you're thinking, okay, there's going to be like one evil dude that's out to destroy that cat. Forget it. It is not there at all. The opposition here is a group of tradesmen, that's what they're called anyway, who have a stranglehold over um, who can buy and sell, what they decide to pay for the goods, how much they get paid for it. Um, and that's it. Like, really, it's just like this rival company who's like a monopoly, so to speak. And it's up to Charles Morris, the protag, to kind of break that stranglehold 
uh, over everybody. You know, they've got like, you know, non, um, not non-disclosure, but non-compete contracts. So like if you buy from them, you can't buy from anybody else. And if you do, then you can't buy from them ever again. And then they end up crushing the other person and then you're stuck to starve for the rest of eternity. So they're really not a nice group, but there's no main leader in the group. There's no main bad guy. Um, there's none of that whatsoever. So you expect there to be like this really vicious, nasty person to be the bad guy. No, not at all. Not at all. Um, here's the deal. Um, in spite of major players on the side of the opposition, um, the, in spite, well, there's no major players, I should say. In spite of the fact that Charles really doesn't get to know a lot of people deeply, and despite the dearth of armed conflicts, the book really kept my attention. It shows that you don't need, in any way, shape, or form, um, in-depth relationships or sword fights to tell a story. You just need to tell a story well. You get to know Charles' attitude towards others, and the only thing that I found a little less than believable was the fact that Charles wasn't really greedy or ruthless as a person himself. Um, he cared about his village, his life, their lives, everything, you know, so on and so forth, and everything he did was for their betterment. I don't believe there's a CEO like that in the world. Philanthropy is a is good press, but it doesn't get you a golden toilet, and it doesn't get you to a mass of fortune and numerous un other companies under your belt by being a nice guy. It's really business is cutthroat. You know, this, there's a bottom line and you don't want to be the bottom line. You want to be the one deciding what the bottom line is. And 99% of the time, CEOs, from my understanding, um, I do have a, a psychology degree. Um, most CEOs or people that are higher up in business settings are psychopaths. Some are sociopaths. Most are psychopaths. Um, they're, they're focused psychopaths, and they're not what you expect because everybody thinks a psychopath is just somebody who's around killing everybody. But they are not, you know, nice people by any stretch of the means. So for Charles to be the one exception, I kind of was like, yeah, I would rather him be a little bit more mercenary in his motives. But anyway, the book holds your attention, and it's the way that Charles makes deals or copes with the people around him that makes it fun. Um, Neil Helligers, whom you have probably heard me rave about for the job he does on the Good Guy, Bad Guy series, has the nar narration reins firmly in hand as he tells this tale. And if you've heard Neil before, then you know he is one of the best ones out there. And that continues with this book. What I love the most is he has a strong and distinctive voice that once you hear him speak, you will never forget it and you will be able to pick it out of a crowd of other voices. If you had 10 people have their voices played, you would know Neil instantly. Um, and that works here. Um, it, it makes it feel like if you like the other books he's done, you're going to go right into it from there and be like, I like this book too because I like Neil. And like I said, what sold me on this book, what made me spend the very rare and valuable credits that I have left? No Helligers. So there you go. Um, my final score is eight stars. The book has fantastic and clean narration and it's a well-told tale with a likable character. The only real drag drawback from me was a lack of conflict. I don't mean bloodshed. I mean that when Charles walks into a situation, he pretty much has it well in hand before he even realizes what's going on or that he even has a clue of who these people are. Um, he may seem like he doesn't, but he has it all under control the entire time. He's pretty, pretty much balanced and, and stable. I mean, like he's got people like holding swords through his throats, and he's like, it's like the eighth time this week I've been, you know, threatened with a sword. I've almost died like ten times. You got to do harder, you know, you got to try harder to scare me here, guys. So he, he's very unflappable, very unflappable. So he's always calm, cool, and collected. He never gets distressed or concerned. Even when he's concerned, he's just more like, oh, man, I need like mm, 300 more gold pieces to get this done. Can I do a deal that'll get me that so I can move ahead? Um, that's where... Um, everything goes. So I didn't have like any kind of conflict or stress or anything. It was just kind of like more like, here's my deals. Here's what I'm going to do. And it was still enjoyable. But I, you know, if I'd had a little bit more of a stumble or a trip, you know, as he went along, you know, maybe not everything working out quite as well as it or always kind of working to his advantage, you know, because some people, no matter what you do, they're going to be obstinate and they're going to just say, no, that's just the way life is. And you're not going to succeed. Um, even when they said that to him, he kept his foot in the door and he kept going until he got what he wanted. It's a good business practice, but it doesn't always work. 
Um, still, there is a book too, and I will be getting it in spite of my low funds at the moment. So like I said, not working, and I only have like really just one credit left. So I'm gonna be tight lipped with or tight fisted, I should say, with my credits. And I will I will spend my one one of these credits that are coming up on the next book. I will do that undoubtedly. So I do suggest it. It just needed a little bit of imperfection in the MC um, to really sell it to me and make me go, man, that book was just it it showed character growth and because really Charles never changes from the start to the finish of the book. I'm really big into character growth and, and I'm big into agency. Um, and Charles has agency out the wing wang. He, he has it. It's coming and going. It's pouring out of his pores. Growth, not so much. He stays exactly the same, which is fine. He's an 80 year old guy. They get crotchety. They don't want to change. They don't do a lot of stuff, but now he's 30 and he's going to have some things happen. But he treats everything like a business deal, and that's just it. There's no changes. There's nothing else in there for you to go, hey, you know, maybe he grew a little bit or he changed a little bit here. I would have liked that. It would have been a much higher score for me had I seen character growth in the story itself. Otherwise, it's really good eight stars. Okay, so the next book is Cold-Blooded. Not cold, C-O-L-E. By Blaze Corvin and Outspan Foster, narrated by Ryan Burke with a length of six hours and 13 minutes. The tsunami had come out of nowhere, and Cole knew he was going to die. As it turned out, he was a lot less freaked out, or at least less scared than he would have predicted, staring at his oncoming death. The reality left him feeling much different than he would have imagined. His girlfriend, Holly, was wrapped tightly in his arms sobbing silently in her final moments. Kitty, his best friend, had dropped the regular dispassionate gaze and gave Cole a nod. It wasn't forgiveness, but something like respect or appreciation. Cole regretted that he had allowed his friend to grow so distant. He should have done more. Nadia prayed something in her native Creole while rubbing her lucky rabbit's foot. Gary Wayne lectured his preteen daughter to repent for all her sins in the face of God's judgment. His voice rose and fell in pitch with the wind. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. As a funeral director, I try to spend my days filling in the long periods in a vehicle or waiting for things to happen by listening to audiobooks. Um, and I was just saying, it's not too long ago, um, now that I'm literally no longer working as a funeral director, I actually have less time to listen than I ever did before um, because I had like stretches where I was in a car for four hours at a pop and, and you know going to a service I had to get up or get set up then wait for people to show up and, and wait for the service so I had hours and hours and hours that I could listen to um, audiobooks not so much now because now I'm home I'm with the family uh, we're doing things I'm you know making dinner I'm cleaning up I'm spending time with the kids so my audiobook time has actually dropped significantly. And it's funny because I can remember listening to Cold Blooded prior to a service, listening to it in the car right back, and it was over before I knew it. I was like, what, what happened? The book's done. And, and that's when I realized it was only six hours. I was like, that was like less than a day's worth of working for me um, that the books held, you know, held me there. And the book just flew by. And I don't want you to think it was – it's short – and it's just over six hours, but it's still quick. I mean, it's like you're like, wow, that, that happened quick. It was like boom, 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 boom. Um, they got everything done. And it was kind of like on the level of the Luxstat strategy by Blaze, where it's it's a very short book, but it's done well and it's done quickly. And, you, you know, you just leave yourself wanting more. Um, here, I'm, you know, I, I don't want to sound negative towards this. Um it was done well, but I don't know how much more I could get with it from the way the book ended and the way things worked. I don't know if there is actually going to be a sequel to this. I know um, Outspan Foster, uh, whose name I shall keep to myself unless you guys know it, and I'm sure you guys know who it is. Um, I think he was going to do uh, Cole Slaw, which is possible, but I'm not sure. Now, as you know, I'm a big Ludus fan. Um, I love Ludus, love Blaze. And I cheer for Dolos more than I do the heroes most of the time. I mean, honestly, when Dolos appears, I mean, he steals every scene he's in. He, he, he steps up. He pushes people out of the way. He's the great god Dolos. 
And and you really just got to say, my God, that, this is the, one of the greatest characters of all time because he's so arrogant, so full of himself, but he's so powerful. And he's also got a little hint of mercy or kindness, you know, like the things he did with, with like, was it Jason's mom? I'm trying to think, was it Jason who had the mom that was, the, but anyway, there's also a bit of humanity in him in some, in some pieces or some places uh, so that he's not quite a monster, you know, like he's, he's terrible, but he's also got just enough to redeem him at some point if necessary. So I love Dolos. Uh, I love Dolos more than heroes most of the time. So I was really down with checking out a book in which Dolos, the great and magnificent, the great and powerful, he decides to try something different from just making the standard Dolos orbs. Um, here he grabs a group of people who were destined to die and saves them. Yes, great God Dolos is great. Uh, then he powers them up even greater. And then he tells them they only have so long to get to a point on the island they are at to escape. See, I give you time. I give you opportunity. Dolos is generous. And only one of them can escape. But also not so nice. Um, they are going to have to have one person, only one, that can survive out of their group. And, you know, it's a big group. There's, in fact, they split it into two halves. They're going to be burning energy in their bodies as long as they go. Um, so they need to eat constantly, drink constantly to keep from burning out. The more they use their powers, the quicker it goes. It's a good premise, but the book it just for some reason felt a little wonky. Um, and I don't know what it was. It never it never feels real. You know, when I watch a movie, like, for example, in which a protagonist is put in like a really horrible position and then doesn't do everything it takes to stay alive, um, the survival instinct really is powerful and should never, ever, ever be underestimated by any means. As an example, I'll just give you, you know, my wife and I were watching um, this series on um, Amazon Prime. Uh, my daughter said, you guys got to watch Hunters. It's great. You'll, the, the final episode is just blows your mind. Um, so we checked it out and my wife liked it. I was okay with it. It was really just, to me, a bit draggy in a lot of spots. But my wife really loved it. And we don't have a lot of things we can watch together because I'm like horror and sci-fi. And she's like gardening and, you know, a lot of those kind of shows. So, you know, we're the twain we meet. You know, it, we go in there and we, we try to juxtapose as best we can. Um, so we're watching this. And there's there's one scene in, in one of the, the episodes where um, there was a prisoner who was forced to kill other prisoners in order to keep his girlfriend alive, there's a gun to her head, and she's like, "Just let me die, let me die," and, and and you know he's just killing people right and left because he wants his girlfriend to live, and we talked about it, and and the girlfriend was shouting for him not to do it, and she probably meant that, and this was was my um, my point, she probably meant that on the surface, like she really deep didn't want you know anybody to die for her. But deep down, she had to be relieved for him not to do it, or not to not kill those people. Because all she had to do to stop everything was to attack the guy that was holding her. I mean, he just had a gun to her head. All she had to do was, like, you know, give him an elbow and them uh, private spots, kick him, bite him, whatever it is, and he's going to put one in her ear, and it's all done. All over with. She's done. Unnecessary murders don't happen. You know, he's probably going to get killed anyway. So, and, and that's always been my thing. Like, if I'm in that position, I'm shooting one of the guys in charge just because I know that, like, at some point, I'm dead anyway. Um, you know, and unless they got a gun to my kid's head, which I figure they're going to kill them anyway, I'm whacking one of these guys just so, you know, it's not all in vain. I'm not going to do, like, horrible things to other people to protect myself. I'm cacking that dude knowing I'm going to get killed. And everybody I love is going to die anyway. So I'm going to take that chance. I'm taking a chance. I'm killing one of them, knowing death is coming for me and mine. But I'm still going to do that. And my wife agreed. She says, I know you. I've seen you put yourself in positions like that before. Um, it would happen. So, you know, she could have let it end at any point just by ending herself. But she never did. She clung to life just as hard as the other people would have done in her position. Um, you know, that, that's just it. And, and, and in Cold Blooded, the, the, has characters who kind of flip from being altruistic to self serving pretty quickly. Out of all of them, Cole is the only one who actively plans to save another member of his party. But then he also has a girlfriend and a buddy who he's kind of been distanced from 
for a while, but it's still a friend of his, and he still thinks of them as a friend. So the question kind of comes down to who do you save? A stranger, a loved one, or yourself? You know, it's kind of hard to say because, you know, we all love ourselves. <clears throat> Even the people that kill themselves, let me tell you right now, I have talked to people who have tried it. I have read numerous texts on this. Like I say, psychology degree here. Um, people who have, like, jumped off of bridges, for example, they have said after they survived, and this is like 99% of them, there's still 1% is which they died, but 99% said the moment their feet left that bridge completely, they knew they'd made a mistake. Okay, they knew it, and they regretted it that very instant it happened. Okay, so <clears throat> like I say, the survival instinct is strong, and you don't realize how much you want to live a lot of times. And, and, and so here... You know, you've got to say who is more important, you, somebody you love, or, you know, just a complete stranger. And I can see struggling, you know, over a girlfriend or something like that, but a girlfriend is somebody or even a boyfriend that you've only known for a brief period of time. You could have been together for 10 years, but they're still not your wife, your spouse, your husband. They're not your kids. How tied are you to them? If you were really tied, wouldn't you have made that transition? Most likely. Um, strangers. I could meet kids down the street, and if I had to choose between myself getting onto a bus or them to get out of there, I'm knocking over kids to get on the bus. A non nice guy, not a thing to do. But I like to live. I like to breathe. I've had numerous near death experiences, and in each one, I said I'm going to make it through this, and that's just the way it goes. <clears throat> and I've been right so far. So now I'm getting where I can't breathe. But anyway. Um, you really have a hard choice to make. The book's pacing is frantic. It's just frantic as the island collapses around the group and people begin to kill one another. Um, it, it just kind of goes wishy-washy, timey-wimey with, with who's going to do what, where we're at. Like, you know, some people make a change of heart. Some people stay the same. Some people are just doomed from the start. You know who they are just by their attitudes or the way they act. There's always somebody just like, I don't understand what's happening. Boom, they're dead after about three or four, three or four fights. So we get a range of powers. You know, Dolores gives everybody these new, these new items. And they, they all get different abilities, but it also amps up their, their, their metabolism. So there's different abilities, and, and these people can do different things. Some are a bit more productive than the others. Um but it gets really, the fighting gets thick and heavy when the groups clash. The story was good. And I enjoyed the glimpse of, the, of Dolos kind of beta testing, you know, variations of his power pills. But the story lacked a tinge of believability in some spots. Uh, for example, put me on that island and I'm soloing my way through as fast as I can. Hidden dangers or not. I know there are bad things in the island. I also know one thing. Um, the people that I'm with are going to be infinitely more worse in a untrustworthy than the things I'm facing alone in the woods. <clears throat> I don't want to get chummy with others. If I get chummy with others, I'm going to be having second thoughts. And the second you have, you know, doubts, you die. Um, you know, and I'm also going to have to kill or abandon all of them anyway at some point if I'm putting myself first, which 99% of people will do. Family's different, but girlfriends and disconnected friends, another matter entirely. Okay, so <clears throat> there was just kind of like this disconnect for me on uh, that sort of thing. Sticking together as a group leaves you open for betrayal, backstabbing, sadness. I would rather risk dangers alone than have to watch my back at all times. Out of everyone, Cole is the only person who genuinely cares more about a stranger surviving than himself. And he knows this as people keep saying like, yeah, you're right, we really should do this, but they never really seem to mean it or it's kind of half-hearted or they're kind of like, yeah, we'll do that, you know? So he kind of has that already in perspective. Um, Ryan Burke's narration is clean and smooth, and I know him from the Tower of Power series and the Magic Tech Chronicles by, was it Chris Fox? Um, and, and I also, for Chris, I did like an Is It Lit segment a while back. Um, it wasn't lit, but it was kind of close, and, you know, and that's why I put him in there. Um, I also know that he's doing a book, you know, not not Chris, but but Ryan, um, for Tim Caver. So um, I'm, he's a busy person, and I look forward to that book more than anything. Um, and he does a great job. I enjoyed him here, and I think he will too. He's done a lot of audio in his shows. Top-notch job here. My final score is going to be 7.5 stars. Like I say, the writing is good, and the story is fast-paced, 
but it really isn't hard to figure out how the book ends. You have a bladder royale, and who do you think the last person standing is going to be? That kind of takes a bit of the fun out of it. Um, I would also would have liked to have seen this book written. If you really want to know the truth, how they could have improved this from two people's perspectives, one on one side and one on the other. Cole and his former best friend, you see it from both their perspectives, both their eyes, and you, you don't know which one is the real hero or the protagonist. Are they both the protagonist? You would have felt more for each of them and gotten more um, questions in your head as to who was going to make it by splitting it up into two perspectives um, so that you really had no idea who the MC was. And if it had a different title, like just like Battle Royale or Countdown to Death or Dolos, Dolos Dooms Everyone, that would have helped to kind of hide the, the expectations. I mean, when you call the book Cold-Blooded, you know who the M MC is and you kind of know where it's going to end, right? Um, so as it was, I was just kind of ticking, you know, characters off until we got to the end of the book. Um, like I say, it's not a shock. It's not a surprise. Uh, you do feel for the people at some points. But again, it was just going to be one of those things where you knew out of the, like, if there was 10 people, none of them were going to die. You just knew that was going to happen. Now, you might have a bit of a shock at the end on, on how things work out in one way. Um, and I don't want to give anything away, so I won't go into it too deeply. But you see my point, right? Um, I think if you had two different people and you had more questions, like change, change the, the POV to two and then change the title. And, and as much as cold-blooded is pretty cool, um, it leads you to know where things are going to happen. Uh, you know, So, you know, like I say, change the title and give me two POVs. This book would have been really great because you wouldn't have known, you know, where you stood as the story progressed. And that's kind of what I needed from this book. And it just wasn't there. So it was good. It was well written. It was it was exciting. It was gruesome. Uh, but it wasn't like, bam, I blew up on this. So it's 7.5 stars. All right. So the final book of the day is The Forgotten Faithful, um, which is a part of the Underverse series. This is book two. Um, by Jez, and I'm sorry if I can't say this, Cayeo, Jez Cayeo. Uh, it's narrated by Wayne Mitchell and has a book length of 21 hours and five minutes. It's dangerous for a prisoner with no hope of escape. It came at just too high a cost. What is this filth? A voice called out, carrying over the screech of seabirds and the grunts and shouts of men working. No recruits, sir! came a shout inches away from Thomas, making him jump in panic, his heart racing. Worthless, the first voice snarled, and the sound of steel-shod boots smashing into the cobbles moved closer. What the hell happened here? The voice of authority demanded, coming to a stop somewhere to the right. Fell out of the wagon, sir, came Boris's voice, and Thomas flinched instinctively. Then you're even more of a fool than I thought, Jailer. You're responsible for this scum. Don't think I didn't see who got the recruitment bonus for them, yet still you're trying to hand them over damaged? Wow, so, like, seriously, I'm back to this world already. I know I just did a review for the first book, like, a month ago, but he had this other book come out, and I, I enjoyed the first book so much. I said, I've got to get into this. Um, I know I've got about a million other books that I'm, I'm behind on, and I just, they all deserve to have their spotlights, but I really wanted to talk about this one for a reason. Um, I enjoy the world that Jez created in book one, and I was really glad to see it grow into a book two and three and so forth. Um, I will say that the fight scenes are graphic and the Naginata stuff is intense, and it's written the way it would be with like the appropriate amount of blood and gore. Um, there is like some sexual undertones, overtones, overtures. Um, I don't know, I just that some people I think I, I know I've, I've read other people saying how it's kind of creepy or rapey or strange. And I, I don't think it like, I don't think of it like that at all. I think um, it's just two people who really are attracted to each other and they are having a hard time expressing things. Jax is just a bit more slow because he's been burned in the past and he doesn't want to repeat that. So, you know, it's, it's just the way it is. Like there are some people I, I know who will throw themselves at another person uh, because they want that person so badly, and that's just where it kind of comes from. Um, 
you know, Jax has said no, 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 but he's not saying no. Um, you know, he's just kind of like, give me a little bit of space and, and, and things like that. But he also, um, if you read the book, um, kind of instigates things too, um, you know, because they feed off of each other. Uh, the, it's the, the little little uh, sprite. Um, they're, they're connected, so they feel each other's emotions. And so, of course, if he's like, hey, sh- I'm, looking, I'm liking the way she looks right now. She's gonna be like, oh, he's he, you know, he's feeling it, and I'm feeling it too now. And so, of course, they're gonna just start feeding off of each other. Uh, so it's it's not that the, there's not an attraction here. It's not rapey by any means. I know somebody said that, and I was like, that's really not the case. Um, uh, you know, so uh, let's just move on from that altogether. Um, once more, I will say that I love the character of Jax and his crew. I think that the one thing that Jez does is he writes really well detailed characters uh, i think that he he brings them to life very really you know he just does a good job that said there were a couple of things i feel need addressing now in the first there was just one or two points where the narration repeated itself um, it said something and then repeated it again verbatim and i don't know if that was a recording error or if literally because i don't i don't get the books to read the books like sometimes there's an editing error where like this is here and then it's like repeated because i know um i have stuff written where like i will have literally written a sentence and then it get gets disintegrated somehow and i won't notice it and then going back through it you're like what where did that part go um and i don't know if it gets moved jumped bounced you know deleted but something happened that i didn't intend to do and, and i think sometimes that happens and you know maybe the editor didn't catch it or maybe there was just a recording error it's it's hard it's nothing major but it was noticeable and i wanted to point that out Otherwise, for me, the narration by Wayne Mitchell is just great. I think he can read the words on the page well and translate them into coherent and viable tones that people use when talking in real life. In other words, he adds to the story well by reading it believably. You know, if there's an emotion and the way they say things, it's not like he doesn't catch the nuances of the way it was said. So if they're snarky, it's snarky. If there's subtext... And subtly, that's the way he reads it. I really think that uh, he does, like Mitchell does a really good job. And and I'm really, after hearing this book, I'm thinking, man, this guy really knows how to narrate. This is the second book of his I have heard, and he is now on my to-listen list. So if you you know in the first thing, I said, you know, I bought book one of Civ CEO because of Neil Helliger's. I'll probably be doing the same thing if I see Wayne Mitchell's uh, name on there, and I don't know anything else about the book. So another issue that I have is the premise of the book is to basically uh, get to a specific place to do a specific task in a limited timeline. Like originally, it was all going to be a there and back again in under a week kind of story. Like so, I'm expecting like if we're going to go do this, we're going to do that, and we're going to come back home. And after everything kind of got set up, the story seemed to do everything but go in that direction. And don't get me wrong, I enjoyed the new race of water people, the backstory, the messing with the gods, you know, finding out who the old emperor was, that's now, you know, Jax has this guy in his back, um, rebirthing old oaths, all that stuff was really good and fascinating. But I kept saying, where is this big raid that we are supposed to have? Um, you know, it's supposed to take place. It was supposed to be done already. It's supposed to have happened. We should be getting there. And it just seemed like, Every time they went out to go there, something happened to stop it. Um, and, and just when I thought it was going to happen, I looked and there was like only an hour left in the book. So yeah, I'm going to give a spoiler here. Um, it never takes place. It, it never does. So if you're, you go into it, don't get disappointed because I'm going to tell you right now, this is more for me to save the book than not because they're supposed to go to a place, Himmel, and then get back from Himmel. And if you say to yourself going in. I know it's not going to happen. You'll be able to enjoy the book so much more. Um, one of the things I, I talk about all the time, there's, there's a couple of key points. One is like agency. Um, one is, you know, personal character growth. And the other I want to say is progression. Um, and in this book, progression isn't really there. I mean, like the story has really good character growth. Jax has agency out the yin-yang but there's no progression. It's literally kind of like I started here and we end at the same place with just some things changing, you know, like maybe we found this, we found magic, we found, you know, something, but that's it. There's no real 
shift from you know what happened in book one to the end of book two, and 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 the, even like in the growth of his his expanse, other than claiming a couple little spots here or there. Um, and I get that you know this is kind of like seeding important events for the future, like you know renewing vows that were forgotten. Uh, that he didn't make, but his predecessor did, and he's now, you know, um, uh, he's part of me, so we're going to honor these vows. Um, those sorts of things were really cool, but there was no progression. So I was kind of like really kind of, I don't want to say upset, I was let down a little bit, and that I wanted him to get from point A to B. Maybe there was something happening with a certain somebody there that, you know, you're expecting, and then, you know, it really kind of causes like all kinds of a kerfuffle, in Jack's life even more than before. And to not have that, I was kind of like, wow, that was, that was just really like, add two more hours to it. And, you know, you're already talking a 21 hour, 22 hour book, add more time and put that in there. At least that part, just get that part. Like, And if he hadn't said, this is what we're going to do, then I'd have been fine. Like it would have been like the book it's, it's still a slice of life. And, you know, I don't love slice of life books. But I'd have been like, it's a slice of life. It tells you like kind of what happens, and I'd have been fine with it. And I would have probably said there wasn't a lot of change and, and so on and so forth. But at least I ha didn't have that. There was no progression whatsoever. I'd have said he did. He gained a couple spots here or there. But really, that was like the thing. Take that out or add to it, and it would have been perfect. Um, so like I say, I enjoyed the book. I, I think that... Jez really has a grip on his characters. Uh, his storytelling is great. I, I really enjoy everything he's written. Um, every word is is well thought out. Um, but I'm going to say there is going to be a slight drop in, in the score from before. It's going to be eight stars just because it delivers a good story, but it didn't move along the way it said it would. You know, like I say, if he just took out like we're going to do this and said, Let, let's get to this as soon as we can. That would have been perfect. But by the, the minute he said, we're going to do this and we're going to go there and we're going to do that, you have certain things that you expect to see. Like, you know, Jax is looking for a brother. Okay. Maybe had he done that, he might have met his brother. Who knows? Um, and, and there was like another thing, and, and this is not a detraction. I just want to say like one of the things that shocked me was he's talking to a goddess and he's given a choice. I can either give you A, um, a location on your brother, or B... I can give you um, something to heal you, to fix you, so that you can actually level up quicker. And the more I thought about it afterwards, and again, I'm, I'm going to say it like this. Jax, great guy, tough guy, you know, honorable guy, not so bright. As much as in, his intelligence goes up, he still does stupid stuff. Um, but I would have said to myself, I'm going to be able to find my brother much faster, and I'm going to be able to do more things for him You know, if I'm stronger. So, you know, even if I can't find him right away, I'm building strength and power and I'll be able to deal with the people that are around him or whatever situations he's in because he's going silent. You know, he has he has no clue what's going on with his brother at all. So his brother could either be in great danger or he could be in perfect health living somewhere. And Jax has no clue. But I would think I would want to be as powerful as I could. And maybe just maybe I could get a spellcaster at some point to find a spell to locate my brother without the goddess's help. So I would have taken the healing myself, but that's just my reasoning. But it fit with the character. So like I say, the character is, the character has growth. You know, there, there's things happening. There is, is excellent, excellent agency with Jax. You know, he's always in control, but there is no progression to the story. So I was kind of like hurt in that little bit of aspect. So it's a good book. I really cannot wait for book three. I hope Jez doesn't hold this against me for taking away points, but I'll be honest with you. Um, without that, I had to take something away, so it's going to be eight stars. Good read. I enjoyed it. I really suggest the series, and just don't have like that expectation. And you'll be—I you'll, think you'll like it even better than you know than what I did by knowing you know certain things won't occur at that point. By knowing it, you are well armed against its dangers. Well, everybody, that was the show. I do hope that you all. Uh, enjoyed everything. I hope I gave you some brand new things to, to consider as you go through your uh, reading suggestions in, in um, you know, Audible or uh, audiobooks.com or BookFunnel or wherever you get your, your books from, uh, because I, I think these books are worth it. And, and I really am blessed to be able to bring you 
uh, books and say, here's what I think. And, and hopefully you listen and say, yep, I, I can see where you're coming from on this, Ray. Uh, so anyway, I sincerely hope you enjoyed the show. As always, I ask if you could, please com leave comments or suggestions in the comment section below. Tell me whatever you like. I'm happy to hear from you. Uh, remember, you can always, always follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher. Um, and we're also, just so you know, we are on, yes, yes, Audible. Yeah, there are episodes of the Little RPG Audiobook Podcast as well as uh, Geek Podcast, excuse me, by Ramon and uh, the Lit RPG Podcast mm -hmm. by Ramon. Uh, they're all on there. So I, I recommend checking them out on da, 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 Audible. Uh, it's going to be great fun for you to do that. And, and it doesn't cost you a dime. It's all free, babies. It's all free. Um, so, you know, thank you. Enjoy the shows in the future. Check back in with us and let me know what you think. Take care and keep listening. <laughs>